Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone from California. I'm Philip Young. I'm the CEO of World Affairs based here in San Francisco. And I would like to welcome everyone to our dial-in Zoom program. Uh, here in San Francisco, we're into our eighth week of sheltering in. Um, my kids are over there. Um, I'm here in the back room. Um, fortunately, it's very sunny here in California, although a little chilly as it usually is. Um, and I hope uh, above all, that uh, you and your loved ones are all safe and, and staying very healthy. Um, as you've sort of surmised, uh, the World Affairs, we do usually do a lot of live programs um, at our building, um, but we've made a pivot. And so now we're going from live and in-person to live and remote. And so my understanding is we've had almost uh, 300 RSVPs to this program, so we're very excited. We understand that there are people not only in California and here in the Bay Area, but all over the world, actually. And so we're so pleased to host for you a conversation that I'm going to have with uh, Kishore Mabuani. And he is in Singapore. Hello, Kishore. Hello. How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us. I know that you're quite busy. We see that your book, Has China Won, is in the background. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, and let me just take a couple minutes to, to introduce you. Uh, Kishore. Uh, Mabubani is a former senior Singaporean diplomat and he's currently a distinguished fellow at the National University uh, of Singapore's Asia Research Institute. Um, he was a member of the Foreign Service, the Singapore Foreign Service, for 33 years. He was Singapore's uh, permanent secretary at the Foreign Ministry. He was a two-time ambassador to the UN for Singapore. And from, I think it was January 2001 to 2000, May 2002, you were president, right, of the UN Secretary Council, right? Of the Security Council. Yes, well, that's a, and so, um, and you've written quite a bit um, prolifically, people have said, on the rise of Asia, geopolitics, and, and global governance. And you're the author um, of the book, Has China Won? Uh, the Chinese Challenge to American Primacy. Um, just for all of you, I met Kishore almost 25 years ago. I was a relatively young um, senior, uh, a relatively young State Department official at that time. And at that point, he was known for being very outspoken, incredibly articulate, and, and very direct. And um, at that time when I was, I believe it was the ASEAN Regional Forum we were at, I saw all of those in very good measure. So it's, again, really, really pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. So for some preliminaries, uh, I think what we're going to do is the conversation. We're going to start out with definitely me and, and, and Kishore for about 25 minutes. Uh, and then we're, we will start integrating questions from the audience. If you feel that you have some questions, please uh, go ahead and um, put them down. I guess it's in chat mode as I'm looking at our screen here. And um, then I'll go to audience questions. I may integrate them as they come in, depending on where we are on the conversation. Um, and if you have a question, what was I? If you have a question at any time during this conversation, please use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to answer them live. Um, so right now we will be going for about, I believe, 50 minutes or so. Um, and uh, we'll start off. Shall we, shall we go? Happy okay. to. Great. So I think what, um, you know, the book is fascinating and it covers an incredible amount of uh, ground and very provocative. And, but I thought I would not start with the book. What I thought I would do really is talk about sort of our circumstances now. We're in COVID-19. We're all in lockdown. The world is sort of, you know, trying to deal with this new reality. And from your vantage point, as someone who is, you know, a, a friend of the United States, who, who, is, who knows the United States, but also is in Singapore a crossroads for, for so many cultures, I'm just curious, um, when you talk with people from all over the world, what, is, what are they saying about, uh, what are the governments and the people of various countries, perhaps in Asia, what are, what are they saying and thinking about the United States in terms of our response to COVID-19? Uh, well, I, I hope you don't mind if I'm a bit frank. You, that's what you. we insist on. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say there's a genuine sense of bewilderment. And it, the bewilderment comes from the fact that the United States has been 
for 100 years or more, uh, the most successful country uh, on planet Earth, and, and possibly, by the way, I, I've even argued that in my previous books, the uh, United States uh, has been the most successful country since human history began. And that's why, you know, as you know, it's not a secret, uh, there's widespread global uh, admiration uh, for the United States. So to see the most successful country and of course the most competent country in the world behave so incompetently uh, in its response to COVID-19 uh, is a major shock uh, to the world. And to aggravate matters uh, at a time when all 75 billion people of the world are facing a common enemy, common threat, COVID-19, as you know, we're still in the middle of the battle. We haven't won it yet. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, we should all be coming together, the whole world, as one intelligent human species to deal with a common enemy. And instead, at this point in time, the United States, instead of putting the pause button on its geopolitical conflict with China, has decided to up the ante and increase its uh, confrontation with China in the middle of this outbreak. And I guess everybody, the, the obvious question everybody's asking, hey, aren't you two also facing a common danger of COVID-19? Can't you stop bickering now? Can't you focus on uh, first getting rid of our common enemy? And that's what, that's what I would say, why strategic thinkers would have done. I mean, in, in, uh, in the World War II, uh, FDR cooperated with Stalin, a genocidal ruler against Hitler. Why? Because you have a common enemy. So you, you all, you, your enemy of your enemy is traditionally your friend. So the enemy of COVID-19 is China. So China and America logically, rationally, should be working together to fight COVID-19 rather than fighting against each other in the middle of the biggest threat the world has faced in, God, I don't know when, 100 years or more. So is it distressing to you that you know, again, let's talk about this where Secretary Pompeo has, there's a lot of publicity that was given to his testimony where he actually said there was a lot of evidence that mm. China, uh, the, you know, the coronavirus came from a, a lab in Wuhan, China, despite what many experts say is a very, very small circumstance. I mean, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think, you know, the best thing we can do you know, we are dealing here with a very tricky, a very dangerous virus that laymen like me cannot understand. Really, this is beyond our field of expertise. But why don't we listen uh, to the scientists? And if you, have, if you or your readers have time, try to download and uh, find out what the Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, uh, Mm -hmm. Lancet is one of the most respectable medical journals in the world, by the way, in the UK. And he says the reason why I've been very critical of the UK government, the US administration, and many European countries is because the Lancet published five papers in the last week of January. Let me repeat that. Last week of January, pointing out this is a very dangerous new virus, killing people, number of deaths were rising, uh, patients admitted to ICUs required ventilation, there was person-to-person -person transmission. All the warnings were given in the uh, late January. And yet, US, Europe did nothing in February, did nothing in March. And then, of course, you had this incredible explosion, uh, explosive impact. And so, I mean, I can understand why the Trump administration is trying to deflect blame, but, you also have to, at the end of the day, it's very important. You're now dealing, as you know, the, the, the sub theme of my book is that you're dealing with a much more intelligent world, a world that has been educated by America. And I bet you, if you go to most governments in the world and you walk into a cabinet meeting, you'll be surprised to find how many of the leaders in the world have been educated in the best American universities. Yes. And all the critical thinking that you have taught people overseas, people are now applying to what you're saying and say, this is not credible. 
But this is what America taught the world, how to critically examine statements, use evidence, use analysis to arrive at the truth. So why do we do that? Why do we use American critical thinking to find out what the truth is? So you allude to the book. So let's go there, which I, again, I found fascinating and, and really interesting and very insightful. When you started off the book, you talked about 10 strategic questions that we were, um, that, uh, uh, that we, one needed to consider when thinking about how to deal, how the United States should deal with China. And I found those strategic questions very interesting. And you posed it in a way of, to think the unthinkable as a starting point. So I don't want you to talk about all 10 questions. I mean, that would cover the whole hour that we've got, but maybe give for our audience who have not read the book, maybe a couple of examples of those questions and tell us why you think it's so important for us to be asking those questions as we look at, the fun, as we look at trying to decide how we deal strategically um, with how, you, how the United States deals with China strategically. Well, you know, uh, as Philip, as you know, I'm, I'm a friend of America and I'm trying to be helpful to America. And of course, we all know that America has decided for whatever reason to launch a geopolitical contest against China. But of course, you know, the key point I emphasize at the beginning of the book is, is, okay, even if you decide to launch a geopolitical contest, the first requirement is that you first work out a comprehensive long-term strategy on how to deal with China. And it's actually quite shocking. And this is an insight that Henry Kissinger gave me at a one-on-one -on -one lunch I had with him in New York two years ago. But America hasn't worked out a strategy. Is it Henry Kissinger? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Henry, yes. yeah I had a one-on-one -on -one lunch with Henry Kissinger in March 2018 in New York. And it's actually sad that the United States hasn't worked out a strategy. And so there are some fundamental questions that have to be asked. And I'll just mention two. The first one is, you know, now that you launched a geopolitical contest against China, what is your number one strategic priority? Is it the well-being of the American people or is it primacy? Now, these are two very different goals. And as you know, one key point I emphasize in my book is that America is the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50 GDP 5-0% has gone down over a 30-year period. And this, as two Princeton University economists, Case and Beaton, have documented, have created a sea of despair. So at a time when your people, the bottom 50% are struggling, should that be the priority or should it really be to take on China? And I would say, frankly, the well-being of the American people is more important than the issue of primacy. What's the point of being number one? if your people are suffering? So that's the first question. The second point I make is that, you know, when, when, whenever Americans think about China or speak about China, they talk about the Communist Party of China. And of course, we, we want to put it as a dispute between a democracy and a Communist Party, then by definition, a democracy is virtuous and a Communist Party is evil. It makes it very easy, it makes it a black and white choice. Unfortunately, we are no longer living in a world where everything is black and white. Actually, what America has decided to do is to launch a geopolitical contest against the world's oldest civilization, uh, it's over 4,000 years, to launch a geopolitical contest against the world's most resilient civilization. Uh, the Chinese civilization is the only civilization that's been knocked down four times and stood up four times, and you decide to launch a geopolitical contest against a civilization that has four times the population of the United States, and the United States is only 250 years old, China is 4,000 years old, and you decide to launch a geopolitical contest against China at a time when the Chinese people have never been better off. The, the, the current Chinese government has done more to improve the standard of the living of the Chinese people over the past 40 years than any previous Chinese government has over the past 4,000 years. And just the day before yesterday, I participated in the launch of something called the Edelman Trust Barometer, which measures, measures trust in government. And the country which has got the highest level of trust in government is China, 
with 90%, 90% of the population trusting the government. So at a time when a, when a civilization is ex, sort of experiencing a major resurgence, you decide to take it on without a strategy. Okay. So as a friend of America, I say, maybe you should pause and think again. And that's what my book tries to do. It tries to help America by saying, think about the big picture. So I, I, I want to then talk more specifically about the U.S.-China relationship. Um, and I think you do a brilliant job of describing how we got to the point we are today. Uh, you, you, you talk about um, things that both sides could have done better. You talk about the lack of strategic trust. Um, you cite that China feel, many Chinese now feel that the United States and Americans want to hold China back. You talk about how Americans feel that China is a threat strategically, which interestingly, as, as little as five years ago, you had this sort of asymmetry where 27% of the elites in China looked at the United States as the enemy, but only 2% of American counterparts thought that was the case. Now that's changed drastically. One of our observers here is saying that there was a poll that said 66% of Americans have a very negative view on China now. So I, I'd like you to talk what you think about our, you know, you could go on, again, a, a long time about this, but what were the big strategic errors on the part of China over the last, you know, 10, 15 years? And then what were the strategic errors for the United States in dealing with China? Uh, well, in the case of uh, China, in, in, and I must emphasize uh, that China is not a perfect country. Uh, China is a normal country. Uh, China has made mistakes, and I, as you know, I devote a whole chapter to China's biggest strategic mistake. And I think China's biggest strategic mistake was to alienate the American business community. Because, you know, for decades, whenever uh, the government in Washington, D.C. wanted to pressure China, wanted to raise human rights on China, the American business community would immediately stand up and say, stop, 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 stop. Uh, China is our biggest market, and for Boeing, China is the biggest market for Jet. General Motors is making more money from China than it is from the United States. So clearly the American business community was China's best friend for many years. But sadly, the, the Chinese, I think partly because of the, uh, America's struggles in the 2008-2009 financial crisis, Chinese became a bit arrogant, complacent, and began to treat uh, American businessmen with disdain, made life difficult for them. Uh, there were allegations of uh, theft of intellectual property and so on and so forth. So the thing that the most surprising, I think, when President Trump decided to launch his trade war against China in 2017 or 2018, normally the business community would have said, stop, stop, stop. This time they kept absolutely quiet. And this was a reflection of the strategic mistake uh, that the Chinese uh, had made. But I would say in the case of the United States, the strategic mistake it made in some ways was a bigger one because it was, the, it was America that decided to launch this geopolitical contest against China. China actually is trying to avoid this geopolitical contest for, for reasons we can discuss later. But America launched this geopolitical contest without working out a long-term strategy. And you know, Sun Tzu, a Chinese strategic thinker, said yeah. very wide. Yeah, Sun Tzu, yeah. I know thine self know thine enemy, fight a thousand battles, win a thousand battles. And if you want me to summarize my book in, in, in a couple of sentences, I would say, America hasn't tried to know itself. America doesn't know its, it knows its strengths, but it doesn't know its weaknesses. And in terms of knowing thine enemy, it knows China's weaknesses, but it doesn't know China's strengths. So what my book tries to do is complement it by pointing out to the United States, please look at your weaknesses and so and look at China's strengths. And then when you look at the big picture, then you decide what is the wisest strategy to adopt to manage a rising China. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten, and I'm gonna integrate this, and again, what I plan to do for the audience is sort of skip through a lot of different points in your book, and then hopefully that will spur questions as we move forward. Um, one question has to do with specifically about uh, the Chinese, um, intentions about the South China Sea. And mm -hmm. this is really a larger question that you address, um, that you've addressed in many different ways about Chinese expansionism. Mm -hmm. And one of the key messages of your book was that you wanted to uh, address what you see as an irrational fear um, of China 
by the United States. And um, so tell us uh, why you are not as concerned about China. I mean, Singapore is much closer to China than the United States. So why don't we go there? Oh, I, I, let me emphasize that we are concerned about China. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I, I, I put it okay. very simply. You, you're in a small room and you, you, you begin by looking in your corner. You see a small cat down there. You're very happy. The cat is happy. Then you're paying attention to the conversation with Philip. And then you turn around. The cat has become a tiger. Uh, and then you say, oops, uh, I got a tiger in the room now. So that's what China, China, as you know, has grown faster than any other major power has. You know, in 1980s, GNP was 10, uh, PBP 10 was 10% in the United States. By 2014, it became bigger. In 34 years, it emerged as the number one power in the world. So, so China has emerged very rapidly and everybody is making, everybody has to adjust to this new reality. Singapore has to adjust to this new reality too. Uh, but in the case of the South China Sea, it, it is not a simple, black and white issue of China trying to be aggressive and uh, uh, everybody else in the world being, you know, uh, innocent. And as you know, I begin that chapter on is China expansionist by talking about the belief in the Anglo-Saxon media that President Xi Jinping offered to demilitarize the South China Sea Islands and then subsequently went on to militarize it. And, and the whole Anglo-Saxon media has been saying Xi Jinping is a liar, Xi Jinping is a liar. But I also, two years ago, when I was doing research for this book, I met a former American ambassador, Stapleton Roy, who told me that when President Xi made that offer to President Obama, the United States should have seized that offer and said, OK, let's work towards demilitarization of the South China Sea. He said to me, this is his word, sadly, the United States instead decided to send his navy into the South China Sea. And the Chinese said, OK, if you want to play a military game, we will play a military game. So, you know, these are very complicated parts of the stories. But what I'd like to emphasize is two points. One is the dispute is not between China and the United States over the South China Sea, because the United States' main concern is freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And, and so China has absolutely no objections to freedom of navigation uh, in, the, uh, in the South China Sea. And by the way, if the United States wants to protect freedom of navigation, the wisest thing that the United States could do which all these previous secretaries of state advised the United States to do is to ratify the law of the sea convention. And the United States hasn't done that. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a contradiction down there. You're saying we're concerned about freedom of navigation, but then you don't ratify the law of the sea convention. And the second point I'm going to make is that the dispute is at the end of the day, a dispute between China and the four other claimants, which are Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei. And I would say these five countries at the end of the day have to work it out. And we, we, let, us, let, us, uh, let, let us be helpful in getting them to work it out. Let us protect our interests in freedom of navigation. And at the end of the day, try to find a, a peaceful negotiated solution rather than to try and find a military solution to that issue. Because if you went for a military solution, sadly, and, and one of the, you know, one of the, uh, slightly provocative points I make in the book is that, you know, China today is at the same stage of development where America was at the end of the 19th century when Teddy Roosevelt emerged. And you know, when Teddy Roosevelt became Secretary of Navy, he started a war with Spain, he seized territories. And, and if China behaved like Teddy Roosevelt, China would immediately seize all the islands in South China Sea, and he can do so in 24 hours. But it hasn't done so. So that, that, these, are, these are the realities we must also recognize when we come to South China Sea. Okay, so there are questions about human rights here, about China. Um, one just came through, you heard that ding. Um, there are others that are talking about uh, the, the nature of the Chinese government as autocratic, totalitarian. So here's a question that you again touch on in terms of the internal evolution of China. Um, and it's a very provocative um, statement, I think, for many Americans and perhaps other Westerners. You, you say something to the effect that it's virtually impossible to convince any Western reader that in the current national and global context, right, and the continuation of Chinese uh, communist rule under Xi Jinping, that 
um, the continuation of the party ruling China, good for China and good for the world over a period of time. And yet you're kind of advancing that argument or you're positing it. And I'm kind of wondering for you to explain what your reasoning is behind this. Well, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, I don't think anyone in America or anyone in Singapore or anyone in the rest of the world uh, should feel that they are better qualified to answer what is good for China than the Chinese people are. And, you know, and I want to make a very simple point that China has got 1.4 billion people. The Chinese government is very powerful, it has got tremendous controls. But if the 1.4 billion people decide they have had enough of the Chinese Communist Party, I think the Chinese Communist Party will be, will be gone. You cannot put down 1.4 billion people. But that, then instead, what you have is the opposite, which is that the Chinese Communist Party now, as I said, in the Edelman Trust Barometer, enjoys the support of 90% of its population. So the question is, what's wrong with the Chinese people? Why it is? supporting the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party rule. And the simple answer is that the Chinese response of the Chinese people is in some ways a rational response because in the last 40 years, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese people have experienced a greater improvement in their standard of living than any Chinese people have experienced ever in Chinese history. And I say this, with some personal conviction, because the first time I went to China actually was exactly 40 years ago, in 1980. And when I went to China, to Beijing in 1980, the people in China couldn't choose what to wear. They had to wear Maoist suits. They couldn't choose where to live, where to work. They couldn't choose what to study. And you know, by the way, there, was a, there were not one Chinese tourist traveling overseas. And you assume that if any Chinese, Chinese tourists left China in 1980, he would have defected and run away, right? That's what's Maoist, harsh Maoist China. But today, you go to China, the Chinese people can choose what to wear, where to live, where to work, what to study, and a few hundred thousand study in American universities. So the Chinese, and, and, and the most shocking statistic is this. Each year, 130 million Chinese okay, work with their feet and become go as tourists overseas. And each year, 130 million Chinese go home to China freely. Now, as you know, if you live in a dark, oppressive, totalitarian state, and by the way, I want to emphasize, in 1976, I also visited the Soviet Union and I experienced that was what the dark totalitarian state was like. I saw it in my own eyes. You go to China today, Shanghai fashion is almost as good as Paris fashion. Uh, people can, uh, the entrepreneurship, I mean, seriously, in a totalitarian state, you have incredible entrepreneurs. So the chemistry and texture of Chinese life has changed so dramatically that people are not aware of it. And so it is, it, it is important not to give a sort of black and white portrayal uh, of uh, 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 China and to understand that you're dealing with a very different China than the one that is portrayed uh, in the Anglo-Saxon media. So along those lines of coming back, there was a question about, someone wanted to ask about your perspective about um, here in the United States. I mean, it's hard, for, you know, it's sort of your view about, welcoming um, the, the influx of Chinese students coming to, the, to U.S. universities. Um, you know, what it says, anecdotally, though most of the Chinese students are being exposed, educated by Western values, have not adopted Western values, necessarily of freedom and liberties. The, the Chinese seem to prefer a society um, that is less valuing of those freedoms. Um, what do you think would be the negative consequences if the U.S. does not admit these Chinese? Uh, I think it'd be very sad uh, if the United States stopped admitting uh, Chinese students into American universities because at the end of the day, these students will become the, the main bridges of understanding uh, between U.S. Uh, and, and, and China. It also means that you will have a very big community of people in China who, who will, of course, after their stay in America, 
go back and also go back with very positive views of uh, America. But of course, it's important for Americans to understand that that there is a there is a very strange uh, American belief, which is which which would which future be very positive in a way that uh, a country like America, which is less than two hundred fifty years old, with one quarter of the population believes that it knows better what is good for the Chinese people in terms of their choice of government than one point four billion people with four thousand years of history. And the, the, the Chinese people have to manage China on the basis of their own culture, their own traditions, their own history. And it is, it is a fact that the number one fear that the Chinese people have is of humiliation, of, sorry, of chaos, of chaos. And because they know when there's chaos, China gets humiliated. And China suffered a century of humiliation from 1842 to 1945. So when China had weak government, the Western powers were trampling all over it. But now that China has a strong government, the Western governments are saying, why don't you make your government weaker? And the Chinese government, Chinese people are, of course, naturally quite suspicious of that claim. But at the end of the day, what I, what I want to say is that the, the Chinese government that will evolve in China will depend on the decisions of the Chinese people. And we have to let them make the decisions. We outside, we cannot determine what is good for China. Okay. So one of the things that you have discussed a great deal about in various forms uh, is the notion of American exceptionalism. And mm -hmm. you devote a chapter, as you talk about it, the assumption of virtue held by Americans. And mm -hmm. clearly you are very skeptical of, of this. And so I wanted you to explain how you view this and, 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 and explain sort of your argumentation about why this is the case. And then, you know, what is the repercussions for that? And how, you know, how can we change in that way in your view? No, no, I want, I want, to, I want to emphasize that I still think that uh, uh, America is a virtuous society, American people are virtuous, but the Americans also assume that they are far more virtuous than any other society in the world. And I think that, to be honest, is somewhat arrogant and condescending uh, towards the rest of the world. I think it'd be wiser to acknowledge that other society, and, and as you know, Barack Obama once said that uh, every society in the world is exceptional. And my God, I have no idea, he got beaten up so bad for saying something which I thought was just pure common sense. Uh, uh -huh. So, and, and at the same time, it is true that, I mean, it's absolutely true that American, the performance of American society at many stages was really remarkably exceptional. But I think what Americans need to understand is that their performance in the last 20, 30 years has not been uh, exceptional at all. And America has made some serious strategic mistakes, both domestically and uh, internationally. So domestically, as I mentioned earlier, America is the only major developed society where the average income of the bottom 50% has gone down over a 30 year period as a sea of despair. And by the way, if you look at the statistics on the pathologies of societies, opioids and uh, crime and everything, uh, American uh, social conditions are much worse than many societies in the world. In America, I give you a concrete example, spends four times as much as percentage of GNP on healthcare than say Singapore does, and the outcomes are worse. So there are, there are things that Americans should consider learning from the rest of the world. That's on the domestic side. And on the external side, America has spent trillions of dollars fighting uh, unnecessary wars, burning away money. And for example, the estimates of the Iraq war, some people say is $5 trillion. Why, why spend $5 trillion invading a country that is of no consequence at all to the United States? Why not take that $5 trillion and divide it by the bottom 50% and the, each member of the bottom 50% of American society would get a check for, I don't know, uh, uh, $12,000 or something like that. So why not give the money to your own people? Why burn it in, in unnecessary wars? And, and, and also, uh, 
because these wars have that, as you know, there are killings of many innocent people. And, you know, even, even in President Barack Obama's time, and he was genuinely a very peaceful man, a very peaceful president. Uh, in the last year of his presidency, the United States dropped 26,000 bombs on seven countries. So why? <laughs> so I, I have a simple, one, one of my very simplest suggestions I make is stop bombing Islamic countries. Just forwards. And I think there will be a much, America will be a much better place. And so it's very important for uh, Americans, and, and by the way, it is, it is possible for America to go back to being the exceptional country it was in the 1960s, 70s, where the American middle classes saw the incredible improvement their standard of living. Let's, let's go back to that America and not this kind of aggressive America that has forgotten uh, how to take care of its own people. So let me pull on that and clarify that, um, and ask for clarification, because you know personally, I believe in the notion internationally of American leadership, that American leadership is, is d definitely needed right now in the world. Um, arguably, you have a Donald Trump who, whether he realizes he's arguing or not, you know, can, there's an argument that says he doesn't believe in American conceptualism because he looks at everything so transactionally, right? That there's something that we are going to get from everyone else and we are just as good as, I mean, we deserve everything that everyone else does and there's no price for leadership or sacrifice for leadership. Mm -hmm. How can, I mean, can you kind of distinguish those us for us in, in a certain way in terms of what you see? I mean, going back to the America where we had high was an example, but can you give us something a little more concrete in a different way in terms of what we can be doing right now? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, I think the world would be happy to see uh, American leadership. But, you know, leadership means that you, the first requirement of leadership is that you've got to understand the people you're leading. And uh, uh, you cannot just say, I'm the leader, follow me. But to see, uh, any a great leader must look at his people and say, do I understand the people that I'm leading? And here I want to say that, you know, one of the key, one of America's biggest strategic thinkers was George Kennan. And when he launched, when he gave strategic advice to America and how to manage the Soviet Union, he gave four pieces of advice which I thought were very useful. The first piece of advice was that at the end of the day, the outcome of the contest with the Soviet Union will depend on the domestic spiritual vitality of American society. We must, at the end of the day, be a better society than the Soviet Union or any other society. And as I pointed out, America today doesn't have that domestic spiritual vitality. The second thing he said is cultivate friends and allies. He said America cannot do this alone. And as you know, in the last, uh, certainly in the last three years of the Trump administration, America has not been cultivating friends and allies. But to be fair, it also, when the United States decided to go to war in Iraq, uh, France and Germany strongly opposed the war, but America didn't listen to its friends and allies then too. And then thirdly, uh, 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 he said, um, um, be humble, right? And uh, let's not try to proclaim that we are superior. And I, strangely enough, as you know, when, when America was doing very well, it was humble. <laughs> if it's not doing so well, it's become less humble. Uh, it's a paradox there. And the last point he made, which I thought was interesting, he said, uh, even though the Soviet Union will be a mighty adversary, uh, at the end of the day, we still have to deal with the Soviet Union. Let's not insult the Soviet Union. And so one thing that troubles me is that uh, many Americans today don't hesitate to insult China. And I think that's very unwise. Uh, you, if you, at the end of the day, if you have to live with 1.4 billion Chinese people, don't insult them. Okay, you may not agree with what they're doing. You can have disagreements, but you know, all diplomacy is in their day about uh, learning how to speak respectfully and, and trying to find solutions. So I think we have to get rid of some of the, the, the sort of very negative public uh, criticisms that you see uh, of China that has become that being unleashed in the American body politic, and I think it's unwise. Another topic for, for people to think about, you talk about uh, because 
America, the United States and China are looking at each other as adversaries and possibly even more so. We know that many people in the world look at the world in zero sum fashion. And it seems that as a result of that, there are a number of countries that are sort of, sort of looking in the wind as to who is going to prevail. And you, are, you have a discussion about how countries forcing to choose sides. It's a very interesting conversation. And to be clear, because there are a number of people here to be really direct, Kishore, who are saying that you're being somewhat apologetic for, for China, which I know that is not necessarily the case, because you talk about the possibility that China may be technically able to outperform the United States, but it hasn't made itself a model for other nations in a way that perhaps the United States um, uh, aspires to, okay, and that we've done for, for so long. So can you talk a little bit about that dynamic that's going on in the region right now and what that may mean? Yes, uh, and, and I can understand why uh, it, when, when an American audience, when they hear us listen to what I say, they hear me apologizing for China because, you know, the American media is flooded with so much negativity on China that if you come across as a calm, rational voice saying these are the strong points, these are the weak points of China, you come across as an apologist for China. So for, those, for every one of the Americans listening to me who thinks I'm an apologist for China, I have a very simple, humble request. You know, I think it was uh, one of your America's great founding fathers and who said, we must show a decent respect for the opinions of humanity or something like that. I forget the exact phrase that he used. And I would encourage Americans to travel around the world and listen. There are, by the way, there are 193 countries in the world. One is uh, America, the other is China, the 191 other countries in the world. And I would strongly encourage Americans to go and listen to what these countries are saying and saying, how do you manage uh, uh, and deal uh, with a rising uh, China? And if the majority of the countries in the world share the American antipathy towards China, they'll be walking away from China and saying, I don't want to deal with this country. It is dictatorial, it's totalitarian, it treats its people terribly. I want to do more trade with America. I want to do more business in America and do less business and trade with China. Now, here's the data. Okay. 127 countries out of 191 countries do more trade uh, with China. And when China launches Belt and Road Initiative, which, by the way, America opposed, and America said this is uh, going to be a debt trap and Countries of the world, beware, stay away from the Belt and Road Initiative. Guess what? Over 100 countries, maybe stupidly, maybe unwisely, decided to join the Belt and Road Initiative. So I would encourage Americans who have open minds to look at data and, and, and try to, what I, that's why I devote an entire chapter to the six billion people in the world. And now I must emphasize also that there are many other countries who share America's concerns about China. Japan certainly shares America's concerns about a strong China. India certainly shares uh, America's strong concerns about China. Certainly a country like Vietnam, which by the way has been a neighbor of China for 2000 years, was occupied by China for 1000 years. Of course, Vietnam is very concerned. Uh, about China, but will Vietnam, you think, join an anti-China coalition? No. So it, it is important to understand you're dealing with a very complex, very, very subtle, nuanced world that all the black and white perspectives that Americans bring to the dialogue on China are a major obstacle to understanding. And I want to leave one critical phase, phrase with all your American listeners that I want to emphasize that we are now moving towards a multi-civilizational world with many successful civilizations. And to use only the lenses of Western civilization to understand the world leaves you at a strategic disadvantage. 
try to step into the shoes of other civilizations and look and see how they view the world today. So let, let me pull on that. So give me, uh, um, you know, we have China on one hand, you have the United States, which is Western. Can you give me very quickly sort of some other societies or models that are emerging? Because I mean, one of the things that you were talking about in the 1990s, very directly and prominently was an Asian way, which is not necessarily a Chinese way. Are you still, how, how do you, how's, how's, how's that thinking evolved for you? Well, I think you are seeing quite naturally uh, the return of Asia. And this, this is driven again, it's important to remember that, let's look at human history, let's say since Christ for the past 2000 years. And over the past 2000 years, from the year one to the year 1820 or 1800, of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. But it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and North America took off. So the past 200 years of Western domination of world history have therefore been a major historical aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end. And so we're seeing the end of the era of Western domination of world history. We're seeing naturally the return of Asia and just go back to your very first point about COVID-19. One of the most shocking things about the results of COVID-19, we are not, we are not out of the woods, right? but it is quite striking that if you look at the number of deaths per million out from COVID-19, in Spain is about 500, Italy about 500, uh, UK 300, 400, uh, US is 218, under hundreds. If you look at East Asia, the number of deaths are less than 10. Five for Japan, five for China, four, four for China, five for South Korea, two for Singapore, zero for Vietnam. So something the East Asian governments seem to be managing things a bit better. Why is this happening? I really don't know yet. But there's been, how do you say, a leveling of competence over the whole world. So the assumptions that, that many Americans bring to the table that we are naturally better and superior, I would say just, just be a bit more humble and try to see whether you can learn from other societies. And it's good to learn from other societies. Okay. Um, I thought it'd be interesting because you do talk, uh, I want, it's important for me, I think, I, it's important I think for the audience to know sort of your motivations. Uh, related to writing this book. I mean, we were kind of, I was joking aside, but in some ways I was quite serious that it's very clear that this book is directed towards the United States and it's very directed towards Americans. Okay, I don't want to read too much into this, but I was thinking, huh, would you write a book that was geared towards the Chinese to tell them what to do? And is there an expectation that the Chinese would listen. I'm, I'm just wondering, on the opposite side, is there something there that you think that what you're saying um, is going to be more, that the American audience is going to be more receptive to what you're saying? And does that give you a bias in certain ways for you in terms of how you think about, um, about American yeah. society? Well, I, I hope, you know, uh, I, I hope that I'm trying to be, you're right. I mean, the book is primarily uh, oriented at an American audience because it was at the end of the day, it was the United States that this decided to launch a geopolitical contest against China. And the Chinese actually are not ready yet for this uh, geopolitical contest. And for obvious reasons, they want to delay it. But I think the one big mistake that the United States is making is that United States says, hey, we have won every struggle. We, in World War I, we won. World War II, we won. Cold War, we won. When the Japanese uh, challenge came, we won. So the Americans have assumed that come what may, we will always win. And it is, it is by the way, it is very, very conceivable and uh, highly possible that America, yes, can win the struggle against China. But I would say, the, you know, the, when you, whenever you go into a contest, the biggest mistake you can make is to overestimate your capabilities and underestimate the capabilities of your adversary. And China, and this, I recommend that those who doubt what I say about China should read Henry Kissinger's book, 
on China. Uh, and, and one simple point I make is that the Chinese le leaders do think carefully, strategically, and think long term. And they are patiently accumulating advantages year by year, year by year, year by year. So this is not, this is not your old Soviet Union that you're dealing with. So I'm actually trying to be helpful uh, uh, to the United States. But as you know, I also begin the book by uh, uh, publishing a hypothetical letter from one of Xi Jinping's colleagues to President Xi Jinping saying, we have taken on the United States, of course we will win, but China must never, never underestimate the United States. It has been the most successful society. And then I proceed to describe how the United States is so, such an amazing society and it'd be a mistake for China. So I'm actually advising both America and China to be very wise and careful uh, before stepping this geopolitical context. Because at the end of the day, I believe that the American people and the Chinese people will actually be better off if they pause this geopolitical contest, step back, and then do a recalculation of where their interests lie. And today, as you know, when we face so many common challenges, like COVID-19, like global warming, uh, I'm shocked to learn that uh, I understand Boston is going to have a snowstorm in May. You know, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's true. But gosh, something is happening in, in the era of climate change. Maybe why don't we focus on really the big issues that are really fundamentally important? Why, why worry about this petty uh, geopolitics game? So I, I'm trying, basically all I'm saying is I'm encouraging you to think hard and long before you plunge into this geopolitical contest. So I think we've got time for two more questions. One, um, and I tried to integrate, uh, you know, we've had almost, almost 40 questions. So I've been integrating them here and there. So here's one that I think people would find interesting. This is something that was top of mind clearly before COVID-19 hit, it has to do with Hong Kong. So someone who knows China, someone who knows Hong Kong, someone who knows the United States, uh, the question is more or less about how do you assess the performance of the Chinese government regarding Hong Kong and how mm. should the United States handle it? Mm. Well, uh, you know, the, it's important when you handle an issue with dealing with China to understand the history. And the question is, how did Hong Kong get separated from China? And as you know, it got separated in the 1842 Opium War. And that's when the Chinese, exper the Chinese experienced the beginning of the century of humiliation. Uh, the British wanted to offer them opium uh, in return for Chinese tea. The Chinese said, no, 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 no. And they sunk a British boat. Uh, and the, Jap the, Ch the British, of course, responded by seizing Hong Kong and saying, now on, you have to accept opium. And that began the downward slide of China. So Hong Kong is a very powerful symbol of one of the most humiliating moments uh, in, in Chinese history. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand why are they getting so angry uh, about the Hong Kong issue. And at the same time, it's also clear that the people of Hong Kong uh, want to enjoy greater autonomy from, from China. And I think there's, there's some reason why they should get it. But I think if you, if you want the people of Hong Kong to get uh, autonomy, uh, the, the 5 million people in Hong Kong or 7 million people in Hong Kong are not going to get it if they go headlong into a, a contest against 1.4 billion people. Then, then sadly, unwisely, they'll be crushed. And, and you know, places like Hong Kong have got to be very politically astute in their way that they manage uh, their relations uh, uh, with China. And we from the outside, if you want to be helpful, let us not get involved and let them try to work it out uh, uh, in their own way. And as, as you know, in my book, I point out that there are structural reasons why the people of Hong Kong are unhappy. And sadly, you know, even though the bottom 50% in China have had their best 40 years in the last 40 years, the bottom 50% in Hong Kong have seen their standard of living go down and they live in incredibly cramped housing. And as I explained the story, the real estate tycoons, unfortunately, didn't allow uh, public housing to be built, which is a major strategic mistake. So there are other things that are also fueling these problems. And there are solutions to the Hong Kong problem that we can try to find. 
Okay, so I think we have time for one last question, which is something that a lot of people talked about, you know, how do we improve US-China relations? And, you know, the question about the answer, who has won or who is winning? Um, and I, you know, I would recommend people read the book because you've got a whole host of recommendations sort of peppered throughout. But with the last, you know, two minutes that we've got, what would be the thing that you would want our listeners to um, take with them after, you know, we've basically talked for 50 minutes? What are the, you know, very quickly, what are the two things that you want to leave us with? Uh, I, I think the two things I want to, to leave your audience with is that at the end of the day, the American people should focus on the well-being of the 330 million American people and the 1.4 billion Chinese should focus on the well-being of the 1.4 billion Chinese people. There is no fundamental contradiction if they focus on the well-being. In fact, they can and should be able uh, to work together to improve the well-being of their people. So, for example, frankly, America needs better infrastructure. China can help uh, America build infrastructure. This is a simple, concrete example. And the second point I'm going to make is that the other global challenges they are facing, especially global warming and now especially COVID-19, mean that, frankly, all the countries of the world, including US and China, should come together to deal with these common global challenges first, which are more pressing, and that are set aside all these geopolitical disputes that has put a pause button on them. And let us try to be, if we can, to, we should demonstrate that we are the most intelligent species on planet Earth. And, I, and as you know, in the last paragraph of my book, I say, if the United States and China keep fighting each other while global warming is happening, future historians will see them as two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forests around them are burning. Let us focus on the burning forests. Okay, so with that, and with the uh, an expression of hope, um, let us close here. Uh, Kishore Mabubani, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for joining us in Singapore uh, for this conversation. For those of you who are listening, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, some of you, it's probably odd hours of the night and we greatly appreciate it. And um, let me just say a couple of things in closing notes. Uh, World Affairs Councils across the country are going to gather virtually for a special inclusive idea summit under a new brand. It's going to be CXC Amplified. That's CXC Amplified. So I hope you'll join them then, at all of us at that point. Um, please join us here at World Affairs, and, and we're in San Francisco for virtual events, conversations, debates, and more. Um, we will have, there'll be programs running um, at this, uh, at the, uh, at the idea summit, the, in the afternoon tomorrow until 8 p.m. So uh, please visit our website at worldaffairs.com slash events for more information. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, uh, but again, I hope that this spurred a lot more questions um, for us to answer. And thank you all uh, for joining us. So at this point. Um, we will go ahead and sign off. Julia, if you could just keep, make sure that uh, Kishore and I stay on uh, for a little bit longer that we can chat, that would be great. And everyone, thank you. Please be safe and um, be healthy. <laughs>